Uh, here is the software. This is Zebra Aurora. So if you ever hear people talk about Aurora, that's the, that's the software interface to the hardware. This is where you're allowed to come in and configure and do some different things uh, to get your either your job files up and running, um, you know, solve applications with machine vision, all that sort of good stuff. Uh, this is the main screen when you launch it and load it. Uh, it has a menu on the left-hand side. Um, when we designed this software, it's, it's meant to be uh, easy to set up, deploy, and run. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to do different things. Uh, when you go out and you create software, you have power users, which many of you are on this phone, and you have people who are new to this. So you try to make a balance of something that is simple to use, yet uh, powerful to use, and then not annoy the, the power users, right? If someone has to click through a wizard each and every time to get somewhere, that would annoy someone who's just trying to get in there and get the job done. So we wanted to kind of take that into account, and we, we've settled on, on this uh, type of software you'll see here today. So there's a couple different tabs. If I have a brand new device or I want to use an emulator, this is where I could come in and hit set up new device. Uh, that's that's the first one. Uh, today, I actually have two devices that I have set up with me. So I'll click, click on view devices. Here is where you'll see them. So we have a VS40 and an FS40. All right. So the first thing I'll point out is the difference between those two. So if you remember all the sales training you've been through, the FS stands for uh, it's fixed scanning. So that's going to be our barcode only uh, emulator, and we're going to start the presentation or start this off with that particular one. And then we have the VS40, and that's our vision. So it's got a slightly different configurator. It allows me to go in and add some machine vision tools. So those are the two main differences between those. Uh, in this uh, pane here, you'll see all sorts of information that comes back about the uh, the different devices. Uh, so you can see what version, version it's on. You can see uh, the IP address up here, the serial number, the manufacturing date. Um, and then here's you know the current firmware version I'm using. You'll also notice that there's a tab here that, or a button here that says connected. That means these devices can be connected to the green. And once I take control of one, you'll see it turn red and say it's managed. That means I have control over or someone else has control over it. So if someone were on and, and editing the VS device, I could not connect to it uh, until that person were, were to, uh, to leave. There's one, we support one connection at a time that makes sure that no one's overwriting someone else's work, making sure that you know, things are all staying in line and the devices are all functioning and working properly. Uh, you can see here, Brian is in the room. He has uh, attached to the VS40. As you can see here, it's locked. So you can see here up at the top of the screen here, it has turned red. And now I could not go in and edit that. You can see the edit button has been disabled because Brian's now currently working on that. So just kind of wanted to point that out. This is where you could come in here and see the status of the different cameras. And a lot of the demonstrations we've given in the past, we usually didn't have this connected. So kind of wanted to show and demonstrate that a little bit today. You can see Brian has disconnected and now I have the ability to come back in and edit. Uh, every now and then when he did that, you can see there's a toast that pops up. We call those toast messages. Oh, I don't call them that, the, the team calls them that. Uh, they, they pop up and they try to give you a status. Here's the toast, right now that device is locked, right? So it gives you an instant update on, onto what, what's happening uh, when, when those uh, events occur. So from this view, I could go in, I, I could edit, right? So I click on the edit button. It's gonna bring me into the device, opens the device settings page, right? From here, I get to dive in deeper about the actual device itself. Again, here it tells you what it is. Uh, the amount of disk space that is used is here. So you can see here, I have very little uh, usage. There's uh, 10.41 gigabytes worth of space. This is shared between job space, so the different jobs you create, as well as images you could store. So this gives you one of the most, uh, I'd say, highest amount of memory you can get on a smart camera that's usable for uh, for people. Um, and see here under the device details, you can see here there, there's more information. Again, similar to what we showed you before. If you scroll down, you can see where the manufacturer it is. You can see what the the MAC address is. So a little bit more information under this device detail page. You could come in here and also write a description in here. So I could type into this main box here at the top and, and say what this camera is. Um, a lot of times you know what, what you set up, but maybe six months or a year from now, you're not sure what this camera was supposed to do or what it was being used for. Uh, when you type into this description here, you could save that and it'll store that. So when you come back in, in like six weeks or six months or six years, you'll know what this camera's description was for. Next, we'll dig down into some more commonly used uh, tabs, right? So the first one is going to be your network settings. So you can see here, this device is currently enabled with DHCP. 
Uh, when I am enabled in DHCP, you can see we gray out the, the ability to set an IP address. And we also put a nice little message in here that tells you why things are grayed out, right? So when the network controls are read only, right? So I, I can't go ahead and make any kind of adjustments to my, uh, my IP address. If I wanna make a static IP address, I simply uncheck the TCP IP then type in the IP address, subnet and gateway. Although all three of those are important to making sure this works. So you, you could type that information in here. Um, next item is the host name. This is currently the model number and then the last four of the MAC address. You can name your camera whatever you need it to be. So if you're running a camera and this is running on operation 10, for instance, you can name it camera op 10, right? So you have the flexibility and ability to use the host name uh, to, to make all of the names and adjustments. We also have DNS servers if you are so inclined to use those. We have this section called live. This is what the current IP address is set. So this is always gonna be read only. It's always gonna tell you the current status of it. It's, it's helpful for troubleshooting, right? So sometimes you're connected and you're like, what is that MAC address? What is my IP address, right? So I could come to this live section and see it there. So uh, it's a nice little indicator uh, of, of what, what the current status is. Um, you can sync it to a, an NTP server to get the time protocols there. Uh, you could also set up industrial protocols. That's the next section down. What industrial protocols are, if I click on this box, you'll see you have the ability to select between Ethernet IP, Profinet, and Modbus. So this is where you could come in here and, and select which PLC you're talking to. So uh, any Rockwell or Allen Bradley fans out there, your Ethernet IP will be there. You select that. Uh, changing these protocols, you do have to reboot the, the PC. So we'll take you through and ask you if you want to, re I'm not the PC, I'm sorry, the smart camera. Uh, doing that would, would make you have to go back and just do a quick reboot to activate those, those different settings. So um, very common in the, in the industry that's out there. So uh, once you set these and later on in the demonstration, we'll show you how to send data out uh, via those. But this is where you set those protocols up on the device level. level. Um, a real quick note, when thinking about device level, it, it, it's across all jobs, right? So you, you can have many tasks you're trying to do, many jobs you're running on these devices. Things at the device level are global, right? So all of those jobs you create, all the things you do below are uh, specific to, uh, you know, tasks you're trying to create. Those are, those are job level. Um, device levels supersede those and, and they're over, right? So you could talk to one FTP server. You could talk to one um uh, one PLC uh, type. So that's kind of how that, that goes over. We do have USB on the 40. So uh, by default, it does not emulate a hid keyboard. Uh, so if you want to start sending data out, like it's a keyboard wedge type device, you have to check this box. This is where you enable that, right? So if I were to check that, uh, it, it would then allow me to select the keyboard country. Uh, by default, right now, since we're launching in the select area, you're going to see the uh, the North American uh, keyboard option, uh, and then it will add more over time. Uh, I know there's like 270 different HIG keyboard uh, types that we have. Um, we're working to get those into the software as we keep going. So uh, that's kind of this communication tab. Everything you need to be able to talk and communicate to the outside world and integrate this into your ecosystem. Next is the general tab. If you've looked at this in the past, uh, there's always been data here, never really did anything. Uh, we are happy to say that uh, we have everything now implemented and integrated into here. Uh, the first one is a beeper. So for people who are using the FS devices, you could set this to beep on the good decode. Uh, it has some beeper volume, has some beeper tone settings you could change and adjust. Uh, I have it currently off for the demonstration because it's, uh, you know, if I'm doing some, some different modes, it, it beeps quite often, but this is this is definitely available and ready for people to, uh, to play with. Uh, the next item down is something called power. This is a little bit unique. So remember the 40 unit has its own integrated uh, lighting and its own integrated, you know, liquid lens and, and all of those sorts of things. So when you connect this device, you have the ability to use USB-A. So USB-A is the more traditional, larger size uh, USB cable that, that we use a lot of time. You know, your mouse plugs into it, your, your Bluetooth headset has a dongle that, that can plug into it. Um, you know, that's that USB, that larger size. Uh, by default, that doesn't really have a communication to tell us what, how much power it has, right? So a standard uh, old school USB-A only has about 500 milliamps of power. While that is enough to turn our power to our camera on to allow you to 
to IP addresses and do some communication, it's not enough to drive lights and do other things. So there are new ports, new technology out there that's USB-A as well, but there'll be USB 3.0. That supplies 1.5 amps, which allows you to do things like power some low level lights and do some different things and potentially solve some applications using USB-A. So by default, it's off. We're assuming that, that um, you know, you're plugging this into a low level USB 500 milliamp, but if you do have a higher powered USB 3.0 using USB-A, you could check this box and you could start using more capabilities of the actual device itself. So a little bit different uh, to take some time to, to play with that. Uh, again, most, most computers that are coming out today are gonna be that USB 3 with the higher, uh, higher amperage. And then uh, if you're trying to hook up into older systems, this is where you wanna keep it in that restricted mode. So you're not gonna pull too much off the bus and, and take things offline. So it should never do damage to anything. It's just gonna interfere with communication should you accidentally uh, you know, unrestrict a, a 500 milliamp connection. Next item down is the 360 LED. This is the indicator that's on every side of the 40 as well as the 70. So when you get a good decode or pass a vision system, this is, this is where you could, you could flash it green or flash it red. Uh, this is, allows you to uh, change the behavior of it, right? So you could, when a barcode reads, you can hold it until the next trigger so, such that you know that the device uh, read the last time. Uh, you can also you know, specify how many flashes you want, how many you know, times per flash or the, the frequency of the flash. Uh, you could do that as well. So all that is uh, adjustable here in that general settings tab. Now keep in mind that this is uh, this software and, and this, these screens I'm showing you are, are common between both FS and VS. So whether you're doing machine vision or barcode reading, all of these settings you see here are identical and, and will look the same. On to the next tab, this is gonna be the GPIO. This is where you set things up for your general purpose inputs and outputs. So, uh, real quick here, the uh, GPIO 0 through GPIO 3 are optically isolated. That means they will use the uh, common in and common out of your GPIO wiring. Uh, that's, that's the GPI zero, GPIO 0 th through GPIO 3. Uh, numbers 4 through 8 are going to be digital I.O. and they'll use the, uh, the power from the camera. Uh, to generate I.O. signals, right? So you'll see here, this page is broken down into two connectors, a 12 pin connector. This is the main power and I.O. line. Uh, this is where you could go and you have your GPIOs, um, your, your optically isolated ones. So I could come in here and select and say, hey, this is my input for GPIO zero. I'm gonna say, hey, I wanna make this my trigger, make it normal. And I want it to be the rising edge or I could do a falling edge or both, right? So these are the different types of trigger modes. Uh, selections you have. And you can see here, as I keep adding on, it keeps building and adding things to this. So it's, it should, it's you know, this is my, uh, make this one an output, and this is my job result or a strobe control. So this is where every time I add something, it'll build it and put it next to the, the next item uh, until I get to the point where it says, you know, this, if you're using GPIO one as an output, you need to figure, uh, configure this in the job builder. And I'll show you that later on. So you could select and play with these different settings and see what happens, right? So I want another output. Right, this is going to be a job result again. So now, when I go and, and play with my uh, in my job, I'll be able to you know set different meanings to these different uh, these different output pieces. Uh, you'll see there's a five pin connector. That's our second connector um, or third third connector on the camera. Sorry. So we have the Ethernet, we have the power twelve pin power connector, and then we have this five pin. Uh, this is a light control as well as additional I/O that's available. So currently by default, I have my light control off. If I want to say, hey, I want this to power and run an external light, I simply just click this uh, button over here. You can see my GPIO options disappear. They're no longer there. And then I could say, hey, I want my, uh, my light to be PNP or NPN controlled, or I want it to be strobed or continuously on. So this is where you could come in here and adjust those settings on how you want to play with your external lights. If I'm not using any of the external lights, I simply turn this back off. And you see here, I have additional three GPIO that I have the capability to, uh, to do different things. And so again, just like above, I can make these inputs or outputs and I could change the different types and signals and those sorts of things. Uh, one other thing here is you'll see here, if I, I look at my trigger input, I could click on the little wheel here. Uh, this is where you could set the input debounce. If you are using rattly old 
um, you know, mechanical relay. Sometimes you get some bouncing in there. Uh, so you could put a debounce signal here on your input and then here under the output, you can have a pulse width, how long you want the, the pulse to be. If, uh, if it's zero, it'll be on for until the next signal. Uh, you also have an output delay. So if you're doing any kind of timing or belt configurations and you want to, you have a blow off mechanism or a knockoff mechanism later on, you could adjust that delay and how many seconds or milliseconds it is past the, uh, the output or the, the device itself. So that is the device setting options. I know there was a lot there, but uh, you know when you get your software or you're playing with your software, uh, now you have the ability to, to play and adjust with all of these. And the previous beta builds that were out there before, uh, these were hard coded. So this is another section that has been unleashed and uh, you should find it hopefully very useful and straightforward uh, as we move forward. Uh, so those are the device settings. If I minimize this, you see we have a job setting section. When I click on the jobs, it shows me all the different jobs that are available on the camera or the device. Uh, currently, I have two of them. Um, one I was playing with, you can see here uh, this morning. Uh, and then uh, the other one uh, is the default job. So you can see here when I come in here, I'll tell you which one is active. Um, so if uh, I can see what, what job is actually running on that, that device right now. Uh, you can see which one's available. I could click on these little buttons here and I could set these different devices as active. I also have the ability to come in here and edit the, these particular jobs, especially the active one. If I wanted to come in here and say, this one's on the camera, I wanna edit it, I click on that. It's gonna open up my job builder page, allow me to start editing it. So that's kind of where you could come in. You also see here we have slots, right? So this comes important when we're doing our job changes, right? So um, from the PLC, you can tell which job the camera uh, should run. So right now I have two options. I have slot one, slot two. If I add another job, I'll add it to slot three. If I create so many jobs that it surpasses that amount, I could simply say, you know, I want job, uh, this one to be two or this one to be one. You can make these uh, change. So in the PLC, when you decide which job to run, that reference number goes to the job that's created here. So I don't know if I did a great good job of explaining that. Uh, in the PLC, if I want job two to run, right, it's going to run this ASDF, ADF job, which obviously is the home keys, which I was typing to quickly create the job name. But it's going to create that uh, and use that job. If I set it to be job slot one in my PLC, it's going to use the default barcode job and activate that job. Uh, there's no need to take the camera offline when doing those job switches. You basically just go, you set the job you want and the next time you trigger it, it runs that job. So there's no, no lengthy job changes or, or crossovers. Um, wanted to make sure that that was, was taken care of.